We're going to start with a couple of questions here. Um, first of all, how would you guys screen for a vertebral artery injury in a cervical fracture? Um, see, see what you guys think on this one. Go ahead and use your keypad to go ahead and answer this. Okay, so everybody's pretty much screening with CTA. I'm gonna show some data to suggest that we might wanna reconsider angiogram, even though we think it's an older technique. There's actually some new data coming about to suggest that CTA might be overly sensitive. Let's go to the next question. So once we've determined that we have, you know, sort of an intimal injury and, and there's a potential that, that we could have a problem, how would you treat that vertebral artery injury, say a grade one vertebral artery injury? Good. I think most people would say that aspirin is probably equivalent to Plavix or heparin, uh, and that most people would treat these injuries. Though, again, I think there is some doubt in the literature. You know, it's interesting. I gave this talk at the CSRS um, some time ago, and basically, um, it, it, would, it seemed a lot clearer in my mind probably six or seven years ago what to do with a vertebral artery injury than it does now. So I hope I don't confuse you too much as we go through this data here today. But there is some conflicting evidence to suggest that maybe we're over-treating these things, or maybe we're not identifying them correctly. Um, these are my disclosures, none of which are pertinent to this, although endovascular techniques are not technically FDA approved for vertebral artery injury. The other thing I want to disclose is that we have a group of very aggressive uh, interventional neuroradiologists. And I think it's very important to work with your uh, interventionalists, actually they're neurosurgeons who are interventionalists, and I think it's very important to work with them because they're much more aggressive at identifying these things. What we're going to be talking about is blunt cerebrovascular injury, and that's defined by the presence of damage to the carotid or vertebral arteries as a result of non-penetrating trauma. It's obvious in a case like this, but it's obviously much more subtle in a lot of the fractures that we see. And some of the things that we think is that the incidence is going up now that we're screening for these. T traditionally, the incidence was less than one-tenth of one percent, but now it's as high as one to one and a half percent, with carotid artery injuries being slightly more common than vertebral artery injuries. The overall mechanism is that we think it's rapid deceleration with hyperextension and rotation. Uh, and most vertebral artery injuries, but not all, are associated with cervical spine fractures. The real problem is it's difficult to determine what the, what the meaning of a vertebral artery injury is. Because the stroke rate in the literature is anywhere from 0 to 33% when you look at these series of vertebral artery injuries with cervical spine fractures. The problem is once you get a, verte once you get a, um, a, a stroke, the, that stroke can be very devastating for these patients. And I think we've all taken care of patients, and I showed that case last night, where somebody had a, a vertebral artery injury, wound up with a stroke, and subsequently succumbed from it uh, sometime later. Now, this is an important slide because the screening of blunt trauma patients has really come through a lot of uh, reiterations over the years. There's two criteria, the Den Denver criteria and the Memphis criteria. The Denver criteria are what we'll use, and, and that's any cervical spine fracture, any unexplained neurologic deficit, a basilar cranial fracture into the carotid canal, Lafort type 2 or type 3 fractures, hematoma or brui, an ischemic stroke, and any hanging injury. Those are patients that probably ought to be screened for carotid or vertebral artery injury. And in the series from Memphis and Denver, it was three to 5% of all blunt trauma patients met this criteria. And in those patients that they screened, they found an incidence of blunt cerebrovascular injury of 18 to 30%. So these are the criteria that you really want to look for when somebody comes in and decide whether you want to do a CTA in these patients. Now, looking at cervical fractures and vertebral artery injuries, this is a series of, of cervical spine fractures in 605 patients who were screened with angiography. 92 of those patients had vertebral artery injury, and you can see the most, um, 70 to 80 percent, had a fracture. Now, the three fracture types that were common for vertebral artery injury were subluxations, fractures into the transverse foramen, and C1 to C3 fractures. Now, 213 patients had these fracture patterns, and of those, 33% of those patients had a vertebral artery injury. So when you see these fracture patterns right here, okay, these are particularly the patients you want to screen. Now, with a little bit more modern literature, this is a retrospective series that was published from the group at Harvard a couple of years ago, and they had 253 patients with C-spine fractures who all underwent CTA. They found an overall incidence of vertebral artery injury of 17%. 
in those 42 patients that had a vertebral artery injury, the stroke rate or neurologic event rate was 14%, as you can see here, and the stroke-related mortality of 5%. Their high-risk patients were patients who had basal skull fractures, craniocervical dislocations, fracture displacement into the frame in more than a millimeter, Something that we didn't talk about last night, but ankylosing spondylitis also predisposes patients to have vertebral artery injury, and then facet dislocation or subluxation. So those are the patients that you really want to carefully screen when you're looking at these trauma patients. Now, what types of injuries can we see? This is a Denver classification uh, from Biffle, basically looking at the different classifications. And we'll go through these pretty quickly here. We're not neuroradiologists, but I think it's important to understand. They're graded one through five, and you can see the definitions as we see here. Now, luminal irregularity is a grade one injury, and you can see that here in this, in this uh, CT angio and this angiogram, as you can see with the arrows right there. When there's dissection with less than 25% narrowing, as you can see in this carotid angiogram right here, that's also a grade one injury. A grade two injury is dissection with raised intimal flap or dissection with an intramural thrombus, as you can see here in these carotid angiograms and CTAs. Grade two with the dissection is a dissection with greater than 25% luminal narrowing as well, as you can see here in this, in this vertebral uh, artery. Now, when you have intramural or intraluminal thrombus, as you can see here, that's also a grade two injury. This is not an occlusion, it's just very slow flow that you can see through this vessel right here. That's also a grade two injury. Now grade three, this is a carotid angiogram and you can see that pseudoaneurysm up here um, and that's a grade three type of injury as we can see here. Grade four is where you have an occlusion, as you can see here, and these are something to particularly watch out for because they can have a very, very high stroke rate, and oftentimes the strokes will occur really early on in the patient's presentation to the hospital. So it's something you want to sort of want to get on and jump on as soon as you recognize it. And then grade five is where you have extravasation. These can be very lethal. It's something we don't usually see or deal with. That's something that they, often the trauma surgeons have to deal with because it's such a lethal type of problem. Now, what's the rationale for treatment in these patients? This is a series from Denver where 38 patients had 47 vertebral artery injuries, and they found that their stroke rate was 24%, and the um, associated death rate was 8%. The overall incidence in their whole trauma population was 0.6%, so they decided they had to look at these patients a lot more closely and try to get on them and, and really treat them. And what they did was they looked at patients whose injury was not decided by the vertebral, uh, the vertebral artery injury, and they found a stroke rate in 60% in patients that had no heparin and 6% in those patients that were heparinized. So this gives us a rationale for treatment. Now, one of the problems with this literature is a lot of these patients presented with stroke. So how can you prevent a stroke when somebody's already presenting with it? And that's a real problem when you look through this in the, in the rationale for treatment. But nevertheless, this is what's out there in the literature, and I think it's important to understand that this was the impetus for a lot of us to aggressively treat vertebral artery injuries. Another series, I think this was from the group in Memphis. They had 216 patients prospectively screened by angiography. What they found was that 29% had either a carotid injury or vertebral artery injury, and uh, of those, 0.7% had a vertebral artery injury. Almost all patients were treated with heparin or antiplatelets, and what they found was that they had a 0% stroke rate when they aggressively treated these patients compared to their historical control of 14%. And again, this is the rationale for treatment that's out there in the literature. Now, what's the best screening technique? We traditionally used to use angiogram, but what has become much more prominent is multi-detector CT. Angiograms have risks, you know, catheter problems, renal insufficiency, strokes you can cause. And so Eastman looked at this paper and found that basically when he compared angiogram to CTA, CTA had a 98% sensitivity, 100% specificity, 100% positive predictive value, and 99% negative predictive value compared to the gold standard. So therefore, we use multi-detector CT angio basically as our screening technique based mostly on this paper. Now the problem with that is we think that we're overcalling some of these injuries. This is one of my current partners, Ramesh Grande, published this paper now, four, uh, actually just last year. And what they looked at was they looked at 140 patients who had 156 cerebrovascular blunt injuries to either the ICA or the vertebral artery. All of these patients were identified on CTA. They then underwent digital subtraction angiography. 
CTA was incorrect 61% of the time in the vessel study, and the overall false positive rate of CTA was almost 50% suggesting we may be really over-treating patients if we're just looking at <coughs> CT angiogram, okay? Good, uh, the other thing is the positive predictive value associated with fractures now is only 60%, okay, when you look at digital subtraction angiography. So as a result, again, we think we're really over-treating patients, and as a result, in our institution, when we identify somebody we think has a vertebral artery injury, we actually go on to digital subtraction angiography. Again, negative DSA 47% of the time, and given a per patient false positive rate of almost 50%, with an estimated average of 130 patients per year screening positive for blunt cerebrovascular injury, uh, approximately 63 patients per year would be treated potentially unnecessarily with antithrombotic therapy. So that's, that's pretty sobering data to suggest that maybe we ought to be looking at this just a little bit closer. Now let's look at tra treatment of asymptomatic cerebrovascular injury. This is again the, the group from Denver, and they had you know 80,000, 18,000 patients. They screened them all with four vessel angiogram. The main outcome was CVA, and once a, a blunt uh, injury was identified, treatment was immediately initiated unless contraindicated based on other injuries. And they treated them at, at you know dealer's choice. You could either treat somebody with full anticoagulation, that is a heparin, with a goal of 40 to 50, or aspirin and or Plavix. Uh, antiplatelet. They had 422 uh, cerebrovascular injuries in 301 patients, and you can see the distribution of the different grades right there. What they found was treatment was initiated for 282 patients with asymptomatic uh, cerebrovascular injuries. There were eight bleeding complications in these asymptomatic patients, but what you want to do is look at the stroke rate in these asymptomatic patients. It's near zero percent. When you compare it to the patients who had no treatment for, because they had a contraindication for antithrombotics or a, 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 a contraindication for anticoagulation, the stroke rate was over 20% in some of these patients. So as a result, it suggested, again, that you should really treat these patients. Now what they did was they repeated the CT angiogram at 10 days and found that there was a healing rate that was similar whether you use full anticoagulation or whether you used um, basically antiplatelet anti medication. And the progression rates were also similar in these groups. There's some observational studies. This is a group from shock trauma. What they found is that they treated 134 <coughs> patients who survived greater than 24 hours and had no stroke on admit. Those patients that were treated um, basically had a 4% stroke rate. Those patients that were not treated, again, with antiplatelets, as you can see there, uh, the stroke rate was 26%. So in vertebral artery injuries, they thought that treatment really was effective at preventing stroke. Uh, not all observational studies are the same. This is some more recent data that came out of the group at UT Southwestern, and this is what's problem with, problematic with the literature. As we sort of look into this more, we're finding maybe that we're not screening for these patients appropriately. Maybe we are over-treating them. They had 143 patients with grade one and grade two injuries and follow up in 120 of them. 70% of those patients were treated, uh, most with aspirin. 97% um, of the injuries were stable and improved, and only two patients out of that 120 had any posterior circulation ischemia, and both of those patients had aspirin, suggesting, again, maybe it doesn't matter whether we treat these patients, or perhaps suggesting also that it could be that we're treating them appropriately with the aspirin. They also looked at grade three and four injuries in a separate paper and found that three patients had grade four injuries had strokes, but these patients had presented initially with the stroke, and two of the three patients had bilateral vertebral artery occlusions when they presented. So again, something that you really couldn't intervene for and, and make a difference in. Um, so, you know, the other thing you got to remember is that we can also use endovascular treatment. And this really depends on the center and the experience of the radiologist. Remember, you still need antiplatelet therapy if you stent, and so you got to worry about your contraindications for this. This is much more common for carotid artery injuries than it is for vertebral artery injuries, but we particularly use it in patients who have either pseudoaneurysms or patients that we want to occlude the vert who have grade four lesions uh, that, that we're worried and we have to take to the OR. Now, what should we do for follow-up in these patients? And initially it was thought that follow-up should be performed seven to 10 days post-injury. But again, now with this newer data suggesting that CTA overcalls these injuries, maybe this has changed the practice at our institution. And we don't do as many follow-up CTAs in that early time frame as we used to. Uh, 
Now, this is a, a protocol from the Western Trauma Association, and this is what most people follow at this stage. They'll do a 16-slice CTA, grade one through four injuries. They'll use antithrombotic therapy and repeat the 16-slice CTA in seven to 10 days. If the injury is healed, they discontinue it. Otherwise, they continue it for three to six months. What we do in our institution is slightly different. You can see our screening protocol there. But if the CTA is positive, then we'll use an angiogram. The treatment in the absence of an intracranial bleed, we'll use aspirin. In patients with a bleed, we'll make a decision case by case and usually start them on a heparin um, drip and transition to antiplatelet therapy when they become more stable. Our target for the PTT is 40 to 50. The question is, when should we repeat the CTA? We usually don't do that now till three to six months. So in summary, the incidence of blunt cerebrovascular injury could be as high as 1% in blunt trauma patients. You have to have a screening protocol because the morbidity and mortality of these injuries can be very high. It appears that the treatment rate decreases, the, it appears that treatment with antiplatelets such as aspirin decreases the stroke rate, but we think there's probably equivalence between aspirin and full anticoagulation with heparin. The good news is that you can reverse heparin a lot easier. So that's the summary now for vertebral artery injury. I hope this gives you some of the more updated information and gives you some food for thought about how to treat these types of injuries. Thanks for your attention. So this was a definitive and very cool lecture. Now what I miss is the following. What do I do if I have an unstable spine fracture that will require a surgical repair and we have a known vertebral artery injury, a biffle three or four? Do I rush that patient to the OR, fix it, or do I wait for the three months or whatever uh, to have some form of endothelial reconstitution? I'll start them on aspirin and operate through aspirin. And do you give them antiplatelet inhibitors or anything like that? No, I don't. We tend not to use Plavix. We tend to just use aspirin. So, but what do you do intraoperatively if the patient bleeds a lot? Are you going to give them FFPs and platelets and cryo? and Just, just use more careful hemostasis. I mean, we do carotid, carotid you know, um, basically uh, reanastomosis and so forth and so on with heparin and, and aspirin in place. So you just have to be more meticulous with your hemostasis. Okay. Yeah. yeah fair enough. And so I started doing that. That's, that's my thing. Any questions or concerns? Great yeah, lecture. Dan. Yes, Dan. Here, I'll get your microphones that you heard online. No, but it's Facebook. <laughs> I, have, I have actually two questions. Uh, one is, it, 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 I, I get confused by literature because people tend to jump carotid injuries in with vertebral yeah. artery injuries, so it, it gets to be a bit of a mess. But, but of the people who have vertebral artery injuries, it seems to me that if we're going to say the vertebral was the one that caused it, how many of these people have, have they looked at, have they parsed out the stroke was in the posterior C circulation, cerebellar stroke, occipital stroke, you know, occipital lobe strokes, as opposed to they had a brain injury at the same time as their trauma, they had a head injury, and then they stroked, right? And then this, so that's question number one. Now, question number two is, of the people who are in the natural history groups, untreated, what's the time course of the strokes occurring? So say for whatever reason, people aren't getting treated, right? Are they out of the woods by 10 days? If they haven't had a stroke at that point, they're kind of good to go? Or uh, is it six weeks? Is it six months? Is it forever? What's the, you know, what's, the, what's, the, what's the time course of the natural history of stroke following vertebral artery injury? Because my memory is failing me, I'll answer the second question first because I can remember it. But basically, what it is in the literature, there seem to be two time frames for the presentation of stroke. One is on initial presentation, in other words, within one to two hours of the injury. The other is documented at about 72 to 96 hours out after the injury, so three to four days. Those seem to be the two time periods where people have strokes from vertebral artery injury. Now, in the literature, to try to determine what constitutes a stroke from these patients is, again, I agree with you, very difficult to determine. Because a lot of these patients, remember, that's one of the screening criteria, is a severe closed head injury, a GCS less than six. Well, those patients are going to have sort of hits all over their brain. And so how do you tell whether that's an ischemic hit or whether that was a traumatic hit? That's incredibly difficult to determine in the literature. Incredibly difficult. Another thing that you pointed out in a, in a review that you did for the guidelines committee for the AANS, CNS, whatever it was, is that a lot of patients who are lumped into the no treatment, okay, actually come in with their stroke. So when you say the natural history is if you don't do treatment, you'll get a stroke. No, 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 no. That's not necessarily true. You got to be very careful because only one paper 
looks at those patients who didn't present with a stroke, who then went on to stroke, and still found a higher stroke rate for patients who didn't get treated with aspirin. I mean, I guess my, and so I, the, the follow on to that is, where do we come up with three to six months? You know, the strokes occur within 96 hours, right? Why are we treating these people for three and six months afterwards with anticoagulants or antiplatelet therapy? Do, do we need it? Yeah, exactly. And I, I agree with you. I mean, that's one of, that's one of the, the really points that we use for becoming more aggressive for screening with these, using the angiograms, is because we think we're treating patients unnecessarily. But then once we determine that somebody has a positive CTA, somebody has a positive angiogram, then we do go ahead and treat them for three to six months. And that's sort of empiric out there. I have a really crazy question. Isn't this one of those perfect applications for artificial intelligence, for AI decision-making help? Yeah, I guess it would be. If I knew more about AI, it sounds like a great idea. <laughs> because everything it seems to, in terms of vertebral artery injury, still seems to be so very conjectural. And you're, I mean, you've done an, a, a yeoman's job with the guidelines committees in trying to put this all together. And we still have this uh, com complete bifurcation uh, with our uh, vascular colleagues, and especially the radiology community is in a completely different bandwagon than our surgical uh, yeah. Uh, colleagues. Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, I work with two extremely aggressive interventional neurosurgeons, and we really treat these aggressively because they always remember the one they got burned with, and that's that's the problem. But you know, it, it's lucky that their stroke rate for a normal diagnostic digital subtraction angiogram is zero percent, because we're going to have a stroke in one of these patients, and that's going to be another problem that we got to deal with. And the stroke rate for a posterior fossa circulation angiogram is two percent. And so that's why people went to CTA. Yeah. Well, this okay. is great stuff. Thank you so much. Yeah, and I just have oh, a sorry, quick, sorry, Andy. Yeah. Um, so, you know, getting back to Dan's point, I think, you know, you can look at it two ways. Um, to me, aspirin and Plavix are pretty benign, right? I mean, how many people do you know that have had, like, a, you know, um, anaphylactic reaction or something like that? I, I think, you know, if... You talk to like our interventional or neuro guys, you know, it just takes one or two of these cases to go sour. And I do think, I agree with Dan, it's usually in the first six weeks. Um, but, you know, the ones that do go sour really go, I mean, they really have horrible um, strokes. And, you know, yeah. so I think I, my personal belief is, is that even though I think we're being aggressive, you know, I've seen one or these, two, one or two of these dissections where they come come into the hospital after they've had their stroke, a massive stroke. So, I mean, it's. I know sometimes I think we're over treating them, but I don't know what your thoughts are on. Yeah, I agree with you. Platics. I mean, that's that, that's why I think, and and I've gone to. You know, I, I look at the data from the CADIS trial, which is basically spontaneous cervical dissections, and it found equivalence between full anticoagulation and anti antiplatelet medication. So I tend to use aspirin because I think aspirin's a pretty benign drug, and I'll even operate through aspirin now, because I think you know you just have to pay a little bit more attention to hemostasis and do that. But again, it, it this the stakes are. High. I mean, remember some of that data. The, the mortality from these posterior fossa strokes is anywhere from 25 to 50 percent in the literature. Thanks. Any other questions? Otherwise, thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Really good. Thank you.